and welcome to the 61st meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via Starleaf and our witnesses for today's briefing will be attending via Starleaf. The meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. And just to remind members to mute their devices when, when they aren't speaking. So moving on to item number one, which is apologies. Um, we don't have any apologies this morning. So not we're aware not of. so far, Chair, no. Thank you. And then moving on to item number two, which is draft minutes. There is a copy of the draft minutes of the meeting from the 5th of May in page five of your pack. Are members content that that's an accurate reflection of the meeting? Thank you. Okay, members, so we're going to move straight into our briefing, which is item number four. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 59 of your pack. There is a document on common themes between the Economic Recovery Action Plan, New Decade, New Approach, and the Committee's micro-inquiries at page 63. The Economic Recovery Action Plan is at page 73. The clerk's memo on the Departmental Voucher Scheme briefing is at page 104. The ministerial statement dealing with the High Street Stimulus Scheme is at page 106. There is a clerk's memo on the DFE budget briefing at page 108. A departmental briefing paper on the budget at page 111. A departmental briefing paper on the main estimates at page 116. An updated clerk's memo at page 6 of table papers um, with reference to the launch of the Minister's Decade of Innovation document. Then there's a memo from the DALO and a copy of the department's A 10 Times Northern Ireland's Decade of Innovation document, which the committee office received on Monday evening at page 12 of table papers. So, Tommy, if I could just ask you to bring the witnesses into the spotlight, please. And welcome to this morning's meeting the Minister, Diane Dodds, um, Michelle Scott, who's Business Interventions Division at DFE. Paul Grocott, who's Economic Strategy Group at DFE, and Victor Gigolo, who is EU Exit Preparation and Transition Group at DFE. So I'm hoping that you can all hear us okay and that we're going to be able to hear you. And I'm going to pass over to the Minister to make an opening statement and then we'll bring members in for questions. Uh -oh. We can't hear. Minister, we can't hear you. No, we, we always say it should be we can't. Um, they can't hear us apparently either. Oh. Um, Victor, can you hear us? I can indeed. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We, we just can't hear the, okay. the minister in the department. And okay. I don't know that she can hear us. I think she can hear us. She can hear. Right, okay, they can hear us. We can't hear them. Um, if we just possibly ask the, the department to come out of the meeting and rejoin. And in the meantime, we will switch to chair's business. Okay. Chair, if we can do that. So if, if we can just ask the, the department to come out of the meeting and then rejoin it. So we will go and we will, we will, item number yeah. three. Members, you can still hear us okay. Um, 3.1, there is a clerk's memo at page 14 of our pack summarising the informal meeting last Thursday with the regional colleges. Um, a number of issues were discussed, such as vocational awards, the role of SIA, industrial action by lecturers, the stakeholder group that is being set up between the universities, post-primary schools, and the arrangements for the next academic year and returning to face-to-face -face teaching. These are all issues that the committee has been aware of, um, and we will want to pursue the issues that have been raised. So if members are in agreement, we would seek to arrange an in, uh, a, a oral briefing with SIA um, to keep informed of the and also to keep informed of the outcome of the negotiations around the industrial action. So are our members are content to seek that briefing with SIA. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving on then to 3.2, there is a follow-up paper from UK Finance at page 19 with an overview of the key activities undertaken by them to ensure access to cash. So members will remember that at our informal meeting with them on the 29th of April, they agreed to share some further information with the committee on pilots and initiatives which are being developed. Um, in response to the access to cash review, a series of community access cash to cash access to cash pilots 
were launched on the 12th of April um, to trial and test scalable solutions to help keep cash sustainable. Solutions to be piloted, um, new free to use ATMs, cash back without purchase, um, withdraw and deposit using an app, development of community hubs to withdraw and deposit cash, use of digital solutions such as SHRAP for digital coin recycling and the establishment of a vulnerability directory. UK Finance outlines further initiatives to ensure a sustainable network of cash outlets, cash back without purchase and their response to Treasury's call for evidence on access to cash. So if members are content, we will seek an informal meeting with the Consumer Council and also with the Post Office around the issues that have been raised with this in relation to, to banking services and access to cash um, and that we will continue our engagement with the banking industry also. Are members content to do that? Thank you. Okay, and then 3.3, there's correspondence from the Committee of, for Finance at page 22 about scrutiny of the protocol. The Committees for Finance and the Executive Office co-commissioned a raised paper to, on, um, to support the scrutiny of key matters arising from the protocol, which fall under their respective committee remits. The Committee for Finance agreed to share the paper with all statutory committees to help inform their scrutiny of the protocol. Um, we will be getting an update on um, Brexit issues next week, so this is to note at this stage if members are content. Thank you. And then 3.4, there's correspondence from the Department for Infrastructure at page 3 of your table papers following last week's briefing on planning issues. The AFI has provided the latest figures on statutory planning consultations. The report indicates that for the first nine months of the 2020-21 year, 76% were responded to within the statutory target. These quarterly and annual reports are also available on the DFI website. So are members content to note? Thank you. Have we got so, Chair, we're going to try again. Uh, so, we're going to bring the Minister and Victor back into the spotlight and take members down. So, Thomas, you want to bring the Minister into the spotlight? And we will see if we have sound. Minister, if you would like to say something. Good morning, everyone. Success. Success. <laughs> I'm okay to go ahead, Kiva. Yeah. If you want to go ahead and make your opening statement, and then we'll bring in members. That's grand. Thank you very much. Apologies for the um, technical difficulties at the start of the meeting. Um, I'm joined uh, here as well by uh, Paul Brocott and Michelle Scott, um, who are part of the team, uh, as well as Victor, delivering um, the economic vision for Northern Ireland. Um, so. Thank you uh, again for the opportunity uh, to join you at the committee. Um, I am delighted to do this. Um, and before we really start into the, the meat of the day's proceedings, um, can I just say that I was disappointed to read some criticism in the media from the deputy chair of the committee about me not attending the committee often enough. So let's be clear and read it onto the record today. I have always attended the committee when I have been invited to do so. I have not missed any committee appearances. And I am, as always, available to speak to the chair and the deputy chair at any time um, of uh, the week. I also uh, want to take the opportunity to reply to comments in the media yesterday uh, from the chair regarding my department's response to the pandemic. I want to put on record that my department has worked tirelessly since March 2020 to support local businesses and individuals through this incredibly difficult time. We have led in the delivery of the majority of the business support packages, providing more than $480 million to support local businesses from all sectors and occupations throughout Northern Ireland. My primary aim has always been to help businesses survive the pandemic and protect as many jobs as possible. I wish to use this session to provide you with an update on my economic recovery action plan and on my new 10x economic vision paper, which I launched yesterday. As members will recall, on the 25th of February, I launched my economic recovery action plan 
which set out a wide range of decisive actions to kickstart economic recovery. My plan has been strongly endorsed by many in the business community, including Dr. Brian Keating, Chair of the Strategic Advisory Forum, Angela McGowan, Director of the Confederation of British Industry in Northern Ireland, Dr. Joanne Stewart, CEO of the Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance. Economic recovery can only be delivered through collaboration and partnership, and I was delighted that both Joanne and Angela joined me at the launch of the plan in February. My officials provided the committee with an update on the plan in March, and on the 21st of April, I hosted a virtual stakeholder engagement event to continue the ongoing discussion on economic recovery. I was supported at that event by a panel of industry experts, which was chaired by Gareth Hetherington, director of the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre. Gareth was joined by Anne McGregor, CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, Angela McGowan and Joanne Stewart. Following the Executive's commitment to provide the additional £290 million funding required to deliver the plan in this financial year, I have been able to make announcements on the plan's high street stimulus scheme, the holiday and home voucher scheme, uh, demonstrating that recovery is underway. The high street stimulus scheme is, of course, the key component of the plan, with a reinvested financial allocation of 145 million in the financial year 21-22. The scheme will provide a multi-million pound injection into our economy and the multiplier effect of the scheme will make a significant contribution to kick-starting the recovery. I know that officials briefed the committee last week on this and we will keep the committee informed as we move closer to the delivery stage. There have also been further developments in delivering our greater economy ambition. On the 31st of March, I published an options consultation on a new energy strategy. This includes progressing key actions relating to renewable energy, energy efficiency, the hydrogen economy and green innovation. On the skills agenda, pilot activity has commenced to test how the Flexible Skills Fund could be utilised to support upskilling. The development of additional upskilling and reskilling interventions is also underway. The plan is ambitious. There is significant work to be done to deliver the actions set out in the plan. We must also be realistic. Recovery won't be delivered in one year alone, and we will need to uh, be and will need to be considered as we craft budgets for the next year and beyond. Rebuilding our economy will require sustained investment in the longer term to deal with the unprecedented challenges arising from COVID-19. Yesterday, I launched my 10X economy, an economic vision for a decade of innovation, which I believe to be a bold ambition to bring a more innovative economy, which will bring benefit to people here from every background in every community across Northern Ireland. As we look to rebuilding our economy, we must strive to reshape the economy in a way that we have not done before. Now is the time for us to take bold actions that are necessary to exploit the opportunities that will shape the economy of tomorrow and provide a fairer distribu distribution of opportunity for people right across Northern Ireland. The 10x ambition set out in the vision is about creating a step change in how we think about our economy. It is not about multiplying everything by 10, but a representation of the ambition that lies behind our vision. It is about fundamental change, challenging the ways of the past and setting out our ambition to be one of the elite, small, advanced economies of the world. Our people are our most important asset, and I want to our vision to not only transform our economy, but transform the lives of our people in a meaningful and sustained way. Our vision is built upon five steps to success. We must focus on the areas where Northern Ireland has global strengths. 
like cybersecurity and fintech and set ourselves as leaders on the world stage. We must invest in and support our people, ensuring that all our people have the opportunities to thrive. We must ensure that innovation is diffused across the foundational economy so that it provides opportunities for all sectors, not just those at the cutting edge. We must look at the way we use funding, getting better leveraging, leveraging challenge funds and at the way in which we offer government support. And we must embrace Northern Ireland as a world-class visitor destination, strengthening our inspiring innovation ecosystem and use programmes such as the City and Growth Deals to develop our innovation infrastructure across Northern Ireland. Above all, we want to ensure that our focus on innovation addresses issues that really matter and will make a lasting and positive difference in people's lives by delivering positive economic, societal and environmental outcomes. I welcome that our vision has been endorsed by some of our key partners and we look forward to working with them and our other partners going forward. Yesterday, we had endorsements from Michael Ryan, Spirit Air Systems, Dr. Jane Brady, the Belfast Digital Innovation Commissioner, Steve Orr, a Catalyst, Trevor Lockhart at the Fame Valley Group, Kirsty McManus and the Institute of Directors, Jackie Henry, Deloitte, Paul Stake, NIE Networks, Professor Sir John McCanning, Queen's University, Dr. Joanne Stewart, the Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance, and Anne McGregor at the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce. A really wide range of business support for a 10x vision for the economy. My officials are now working with key partners to develop a programme to deliver our vision, to signal our direction of travel over the next decade. And I truly believe that the decade will define us and that the vision can transform our economy. And by working together, we can build a bigger, brighter, better future that provides opportunity for all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister, for that um, statement and for laying out the, um, the Economic Recovery Action Plan and, and also the, the new um, economic vision that was published yesterday. And, and just to say at the start that it, as, as Chair of the Economy Committee and as a committee, we have engaged with the Department constructively and critically where um, appropriate over the course of the past year. And of course, that's our job as scrutineers and it's something that we will continue to do in, in a constructive way as possible. Um, just to say, I suppose, about the economic vision and the economic recovery action plan and even comparing back to New Decade, New Approach, the, the committee office has done a very useful analysis for us um, of the, the various plans um, and the commitments made in New Decade New Approach and compared that to um, the responses to the committee's own micro-inquiries and there, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of similar themes coming through in that so that is something that um, we think is, is really helpful, is really useful, um, it's a really useful tool so thankful, thanks to the committee office for, for preparing that for us, it has been helpful to us in terms of um, scrutinising the, the plans compared to what we are hearing. Um, I guess I would just ask, Minister, because you referred um, in your, your comments to you know, a collaborative approach, um, and in the, uh, the new vision that was published yesterday, there is reference to needing to work with, in lockstep with other strategies and policies within both the department and across the executive. So I was just wondering, has the new um, vision plan, has that received executive endorsement? Have executive colleagues been involved in, in the development of that plan? Um, thank you. I'm really sorry. Now I can see myself again. It's really quite strange. Um, um, no, well, the, the plan is obviously the plan from the Department of the Economy and myself as Minister. We will now feed that plan into the Executive's Recovery Programme. Um, and just as we have done the Economic Recovery uh, Plan, so that it can become part 
of the whole executive's recovery plan and vision for Northern Ireland, and indeed part um, of the future development of the programme for government. This is our vision for the Northern Ireland economy. We are now going to work out to work with stakeholders to develop the collaborative actions that we need to take. Um, and in reference to your um, statement about collaboration, I absolutely agree with you. Um, developing an economy for the future um, and being able to um, implement plans around the economy for the future is not the sole um, prerogative or domain of uh, the economy department. It will require collaboration across industry. And for that, I am absolutely grateful for the work and the input into the vision of a wide range of stakeholders um, across the economy and the endorsement of a wide range of stakeholders uh, across the economy. But economic recovery and a vision of innovation for the next decade will be part of the programme for government and it will be part of what every department would have to do in order to take this economy forward. We have noticed, I mean, over the last year, we have seen enormous changes in our economy. We've seen enormous changes in how we interact, in how we communicate, um, and in how the, uh, the economy will work. Those changes will accelerate in the next number of years, and we need to be at the forefront of those changes. And that will require every department and the cooperation of every minister, and of course this vision will be fed into that recovery strategy and the programme for government. Okay, th thanks for that, Minister, and we we will be keen to see how, how that is going to work, and I, I suppose um, I, I would have expected perhaps that the economic recovery plan would have taken cognizance of the, of the programme for government um, commitments as well, and we would, like, we would like to see how those are going to tie in um, closely together. I think that's really important going forward that there is that... Um, there is a cohesion to how all of these things are being rolled out. Um, and I guess if I was looking at the, um, the vision document, um, and, and it strikes me that you know, it's mentioned in that, you know, that we, have, we suffer from low productivity and other economic challenges, but there's no real analysis of, of what the failures of previous economic policies that haven't um, delivered in terms of improving those things to understand what um, didn't work. And also, it mentions in the document the measures for success, but those haven't been fully developed yet. So I was just wondering um, how you see that being taken forward, how you see that um, those measures being developed, and, and will those align with the programme for government outcomes? Thank you. Um, I'm happy to bring some of my colleagues in on this, but I will make a few remarks on this because this is actually really, really important. The 10X um, economy document is a vision. It is a big, bright, bold vision. It's also a challenge. It's a challenge to every department. It's a challenge to every minister. How we become, how we get, you know, a 10X economy, how we get a 10X government, how we get governments that are operating at an optimum level. It is a challenge and a vision. Currently, Northern Ireland um, operates in the lower um, quartile of small economies across the world. We think that Northern Ireland, and we believe that Northern Ireland, has both the vision and the capability to be truly one of the most advanced, small, prosperous economies in the world. And this vision, this document, this challenge is um, to all of us to actually um, work together to make sure that we deliver that. So our um, progress within that league table of those small advanced economies um, will be how we measure success. So how are we going to actually do that? Well, we're going to focus on our core strengths. We're going to focus on the skills of our people. We're going to focus on the things that we are truly, truly world class. And I, I'm going to ask I, either Michelle or, or, or any of the officials can come in on this, because I think it's really important to, to try to bring this down. But yesterday, I was um, at uh, one of the really, really big film productions that is 
currently ongoing in Belfast. Talking to one of the executive producers from Netflix, they arrived here to film a, a new production, which will go across the world, across the whole network. They originally intended for that production to be filmed partly here in Belfast, partly in um, the rest of the United Kingdom. They had locations in England in mind. When they got here, they were so blown away by the skills, by the talent, by the workforce, that they have now decided to film the whole production in Belfast. And one of the, the executive producers from Netflix yesterday was saying that this place, this Northern Ireland, this industry, this part of our economy has the potential to be absolutely, truly great um, among uh, those places in the world where these kinds of productions are filmed. Now that's a testament um, to the, the, the people who have created this industry almost out of nothing. Um, for Northern Ireland, but it's also a testament to the skills of our people, but it's also reflected in the jobs, the makeup artists, the people who are um, making clothes, designing sets, um, and at how those really major um, world stars come and find uh, the, that they have everything they need here in Northern Ireland. We can accelerate and we can get and build better and do more. And those are the kind of things that we want to do um, for our economy. Create the really big, big vision. Maybe Paul or Michelle will want to come in um, on the, the focus of the vision. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Minister. I hope you can hear the chat. Um, perfect. Um, so you asked what, what makes this different. I think the Minister touched on a key point now is that the timing of this is relevant, so the document reflects where we are, both uh, what's happening in Northern Ireland and global trends around the world. There are exciting things happening in the economy that perhaps weren't there for previous documents of this nature, and this captures that energy and reflects it, which is different. There's a transformational mindset, so the ambition within the document is substantially different than what you may have seen in previous documents, either here or, or certainly when we've done our research and anywhere else. The industry support that we've gathered, I think that reflects the timing and the consensus that now is the right time to demonstrate this level of ambition and transformational mindset. Uh, and then in the document, we talk about the need to focus, and I think that is um, a marked difference to previous approaches uh, and focus on key areas of strength. So we talk about the eight technologies where we have the potential to be global leaders and how those technologies can translate through the whole economy, but also be concentrated into those five clusters. And those clusters at the moment represent the opportunity to be global leaders uh, and the development and into the future, they can evolve into new, um, new clusters where we can also be uh, globally leading uh, in those areas. And you asked about the measures of success, and, and, and Victor, I'm sure, will, will want to have some detail. The, the ultimate aim here, as the Minister explained, is, is for Northern Ireland to move into that most competitive um, league of small advanced economies. Um, and, and as I said, Victor will, will add some detail across the three areas where those indices um, will we'll be able to sort of track that progress, both at a global level, so we'll be able to see how we compare with our competitors. Um, but also bringing back to your point about PFG, I think it's really important that this is, a, is, is used as a tool to inform policy and programme so we can see at a, a granular level how we are performing and how that performance is fed back into PFG. Victor, is, is there any detail that you'd like to add just on the uh, small advanced economy metrics that we're developing? Okay. Victor, you're um, muted. Um, yeah. Oh. Oh, am I still muted? I don't know you're okay. I tried to unmute myself, but I... You're all right. Are we okay now? Yeah. Okay, sorry, a wee bit of a delay there. Um, no, thanks, thanks, Paul, and uh, th thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, this is a, 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 this is work in progress in terms of um, uh, developing and making sure that the kind of measurement approach is absolutely world class uh, in, in terms of taking this forward. Our appetite here is to make sure that as we, we take this forward, we're comparing ourselves with best in class economies that are of a similar size and shape. Uh, to, to Northern Ireland, uh, both to understand how we're improving our performance uh, over time and understand and I suppose the challenges that lie ahead for us uh, in terms of realizing the ambition uh, of this vision, but actually also learning from, you know, fr from good practice 
us elsewhere in terms of some of those really elite, uh, small, advanced economies that uh, that are, are um, that we're taking our our, our, our um, examples from uh, around the globe. So there are three interlock interlocking legs of the stool in terms of the way we plan to uh, measure and identify and define metrics to measure this. So one is very much in that innovation-led economic growth piece, um, where we will be using uh, internationally recognized indicators uh, in terms of where we are and how we compare with, with other economies. Minister has always already uh, mentioned that we're in the wrong end of the quartile uh, of quartiles uh, at the minute on some of these indicators and we really have a need to uh, improve our uh, uh, our performance on these kind of indicators like um, business expense expenditure and R&D, productivity uh, and indicators like that. But there's two other uh, interlocking legs of the stool of this as well. And it's very much around bolstering that innovation led economic growth in a way that delivers inclusive growth uh, and delivers uh, on the green growth agenda. So those I think are, are critically important in terms of both benchmarking ourselves internationally, um, uh, but learning lessons from good practice elsewhere. And there's a commitment within uh, the document uh, at, at a level down from that top tier set of indicators where we will be and are developing a set of uh, performance metrics at program level, which will tie in and be uh, you know, uh, coherent with uh, the program for government uh, commitments and metrics uh, that are there. And that is really seeking to ensure that we understand how what we do at program level uh, will clearly influence that tier one uh, performance in terms of how we compare to, uh, to other small advanced economies uh, around the globe. Thanks for that. And maybe um, Victor or Paul, I, and I would ask just as well, in relation to the approach of picking um, sectors or clusters, um, is there perhaps a, a, a concern that you could be in that respect picking winners you know, in the local economy rather than uh, looking at all sectors, analysing what their needs are and then responding to meet those needs in terms of skills or other supports that might be necessary that is going to actually drive um, that kind of more inclusive economic development. It was just, you know, is that something that is perhaps a concern in the approach that's being taken within this vision? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're conscious of that, uh, which is why we put in extensive effort into consulting to make sure that the, the technologies and courses that we represented in the document are where we've got key strengths now. Um, but we've also gone to, um, you'll see in the document, efforts to say that this will change. Um, and it's important on policymakers to be flexible and agile to see when the global economy changes and when Northern Ireland's strengths within that global economy change, that we adapt to policy response to fit with that. And, and we're certainly not picking winners. Uh, I think that the objective of the document is about creating an environment where key strengths within the economy can thrive rather than picking individuals and backing them. And a, uh, referring back to previous documents, so the government has tended to do a poor job of picking winners. What we can do is create space for people to thrive and do quite exciting things in the Northern economy, and then for that to feature on the global stage. Um, so, I mean, Paul is quite right. This isn't about picking winners or picking one sector over another sector. Um, we shouldn't be afraid to focus on our strengths. We want to build on our strengths and then to help other sectors to grow. Um, and what we have here is a very wide ranging um, set of uh, proposals around different sectors that we think um, are extremely important, that have the potential to grow, that have the potential uh, to contribute hugely to making Northern Ireland um, part of the global uh, elite small economies of the world. Um, this is a, a, a vision, but it's also a living document. It's not meant to sit in stone for 10 years, never to be looked at, never to be changed, never to be developed and never to be worked with. Um, we intend that this document reflects um, the vision, but it also is adaptable enough um, to change uh, to suit uh, where the Northern Ireland economy needs it to be. And of course, we are absolutely keen to hear from the committee 
um, and from individuals, from the chair, vice chair, whoever, um, about who, where they think um, the document should go um, and the sectors um, within the document. But um, as of now, this is where we think our strengths are. This is where we think the global um, economy is and where the change and growth um, is going to come from um, and how we can reflect that for success for Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Can I bring Stuart into the spotlight, please? Um, thank you very much, and, and good morning, Minister. And um, thank you for, for bringing forward your plan uh, to us. Um, what I'd like to look at are just some of the, the, the uh, big headline issues in the plan and, uh, as it goes forward. And I understand the explanation that you've given in terms of how it fits in with the broader executive strategy uh, to deliver uh, a recovery uh, post-COVID for us. But there, there are a number of areas in the, in the plan where it, it either falls short or indeed doesn't really cover uh, the type of things that I think people would reasonably expect to see in a recovery plan. Um, for example, uh, you, you make reference to, to, to lifelong learning in the plan, and that is very important. But we need to be able to see how that can kick off immediately in terms of how we develop skills and perhaps indeed how that ties into the broader UK uh, policy, which seems to be emerging uh, to allow people access to university and other courses, regardless of age through life. If you haven't, if you haven't got to that level of education before and haven't had a grant, uh, can you see that being rolled out here in Northern Ireland? The second area that, that, that I think probably the one that causes me some of the, the greatest concern is that my, my reading of what you have set out is that initially there is only £20 million set aside to develop uh, what might be seen as Green New Deal type uh, aspects of our economy and how we would how, how that should be front and centre of, of any economic recovery as we move the United Kingdom towards a carbon neutral uh, economy, how we, how we uh, move to, to, to uh, protect and improve our environment. One other area that you've made reference to, but again, haven't really spelled out in any detail, and, and I agree with you, it's vitally important that Northern Ireland has a comp is competitive and that it has competitive access no matter where that is around the world. In addition to, and I know you will tell us that the United Kingdom is our largest and closest trading partner, but the reality is that we've spent 40 years developing deep roots and bonds into the, into the EU. And, and I need to understand where the vision is in your plan to deliver that competitive access for Northern Ireland into the EU and indeed in other parts of the world. Just two other uh, very, very quick questions for you, Minister. Coming out of the uh, pandemic, it is very clear that many women have withdrawn from the play, from, from, from work and from the world of work. And it, it seems to me that it would be vitally important that any recovery plan sets out a vision as to how we're going to encourage women to return to the marketplace, how we're going to encourage women to return to the world of work, and how you're going to be able to facilitate that in terms of innovative ways in relation to childcare, family caring responsibilities, and all of that. It's vitally important that we have the employment laws and the employment protections in place to encourage women back into the world of work. We have lost women from the world of work because of the pandemic, and it needs to be a high priority to encourage their return to the world of work. Going back, Minister, again to the issue around uh, skills and skills development, it was alarming to read an article in the Financial Times yesterday where the United Kingdom has a massive deficit in HGV drivers. We have relied uh, over the last 20 years uh, on essentially drivers coming from Europe and predominantly from Eastern Europe uh, to fill uh, those, those those vehicles that drive right across from, 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 from the island of Ireland the whole way to the, to the edges of the European borders. And again, there's a massive gap there, um, and perhaps it's an area that we should be looking at uh, to see how people from uh, Northern Ireland can fill those roles in terms of driving responsibilities, um, and that, that we should achieve, seek to achieve that. And then finally, Minister, and I don't mean to be rude or, or about this, but I think it's clear that you either will be in a very different role uh, next week or perhaps no role next week. 
how do you see your successor, or, or indeed, a, 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 if not your successor, a future mandate taking forward your 10x economy plan? Um, so I'll maybe start with the first, um, as the scripture says, the first shall be last, or the last shall be first. So we'll maybe start with the, the last comment first. I mean, what I do or I don't do um, after this week or next week will be for the party leader, um, and that is, is fine with me. What we have been developing is a vision for the Northern Ireland economy, a vision that will outlast um, this mandate and indeed probably the next mandate. It looks at the changes the Northern Ireland economy needs to make um, in order to be truly world class and in order to lead and to provide opportunity for everyone right across Northern Ireland. And I believe that when we are providing opportunity for our people, then we will have a stable, settled Northern Ireland where everyone can feel that they have a stake and that they have a role to play. And that's the importance of the vision and that's the importance uh, that I attach uh, to the role of economy minister. Um, so that, for me, is pretty fundamental um, to how Northern Ireland will succeed and thrive and how communities right across Northern Ireland will succeed and thrive. We have a really long list of questions here, Stuart, so I'm going to try to um, get through them as best I can. So in relation to skills, I think um, most people will recognise that as a minister responsible for further and higher education um, and indeed uh, training organisations and skills right through from level one, this has been one of the passions, one of the things that I have talked about constantly since uh, becoming minister. Again, it ties in with that vision of a settled, prosperous Northern Ireland with opportunity for everyone. And that is, is, is quite fundamental. I see skills uh, to building the economy and building uh, Northern Ireland. So um, we have uh, introduced a really wide range um, of um, issues in relation to skills um, from apprenticeships to changes that will be made um, at level one and indeed levels two and three um, to how people um, are, are working uh, in, uh, within the training programmes. We have introduced a, a review um, at levels four and five to see the skills that the Northern Ireland economy needs. Um, and why um, we are doing all of this, because we need to focus and build our skills base. Part of the Economic Recovery Action Plan sees around 30 million being devoted to the development of skills in the next year, additional to everything else that we will be doing. So skills are a massively important issue for this department and is absolutely fundamental to the success of the economy in Northern Ireland. Um, in terms of lifelong learning, I am a, a, a huge fan of lifelong learning and of the work that has been done, particularly by the Open University to encourage lifelong learning. And Stuart, you will know that we have, um, over the course of the pandemic, created 5,000 places um, and courses for our, our places for people who have been on furlough to actually take part in reskilling and upskilling and improve their ability um, to um, rise um, in the labour market. In terms of apprenticeships, um, we have introduced our apprenticeship programmes, our recovery programmes, um, our programme for new apprenticeships. And I hope later this year that we will be able to announce um, a programme that will look at all age apprenticeships because I let you believe, and I have done it many times in my life, um, that reskilling, upskilling, changing pathways, changing direction is entirely possible at any uh, stage of our life. I have reached the stage in my life where I, I think that ageism is one of the, the real difficulties that we uh, indeed face. So broader skills, more skills, lifelong skills, these are all fundamental to growing the economy. 
Um, the green economy, yes, the, um, the document does uh, talk about 20 million, the Economic Recovery Action Plan does talk about 20 million for uh, the, the green economy. Remember, this is a one year plan. This money must be spent within 21, 21 22, and we are big developing actions in relation to that. But the broader vision, for the green economy will be within the new energy strategy where we will talk about how we can use the green economy for recovery, for more jobs, for greater innovation within the economy. Access um, into the EU, um, and of course that is fundamental uh, to Northern Ireland, but again I will repeat, um, and it is absolutely worth repeating, that Northern Ireland companies do more business to and in and from uh, the GB market um, than they do in every other part of the world put together. That isn't to say that we would want, not want to develop our opportunities within that, but that is really important. And I hope that I will be able at the end of this year to go to Brussels um, and to take some of those economic messages um, from Northern Ireland um, to uh, Brussels and indeed uh, the wider European markets. However, again, I was up in London Derry a couple of weeks ago um, at one of our most important and exciting um, meat um, plants. And they were indicating that actually for them, the European Union is a market that is actually declining and the rest of the world is a market that is actually growing. So that's not just important to focus on Europe, but it's important to focus on Northern Ireland's global vision and global outreach within uh, all of those markets. And indeed, we have been successful in working with the Northern Ireland office um, to actually gain some uh, additional funding so that we can actually increase Northern Ireland's presence in world markets in line with an international trade policy. Um, women um, within uh, the pandemic, I have consistently warned that um, for us, um, that women and the role of women in the workforce has been um, undermined um, and impacted dreadfully by the pandemic, um, particularly for those women who are in part-time, um, zero-hour contracts uh, or lower-wage jobs. Um, and that is hugely important. And those who know my background will also know that I have been um, an absolute um, staunch supporter um, of the women's centres in Northern Ireland and the work they do. Um, and indeed was at the Cooley Women's Centre um, recently to look at their training programmes and how um, they are, have been engaging uh, with women um, and readying them for the workforce um, as we emerge into the recovery phase um, after the pandemic. Um, skills and HGV drivers, of course, um, we need to continue to reskill and upskill. And indeed, I was also talking to a company in my own constituency, uh, a huge haulage company, where one of their programmes, um, and we will talk to them around the skills issue in this, is about access to HGV uh, licence holders, and particularly from Northern Ireland. So, hugely important issues. Thank you for raising them. Thank you. Can we bring John Stewart into the spotlight, please? <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Uh, Minister, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Yes. Thanks, Thanks, and I hope you're well. Thanks for your presentation and answers so far. Um, just a couple of things for me, um, unless we get back around. Again, I just want to echo, first of all, Stuart's comments around supporting women and young people back into work and in terms of reskill. And I think that is essential. But I think given the climate that we're in and the way things are changing, we do need a complete overhaul and rethinking about how we do that and make it as flexible as possible given the restraints especially that many young women are facing and it has to be able to throughout life as well and that idea of lifelong learning and being able to reskill is so important but i'm conscious you've answered that um you did touch on the need for flexibility in any whether it's a 10x vision plan or the economic recovery plan i think that is essential as well um so is continuity of message um maybe like myself you share the frustration that time and time again the executive or government in general make plans strategies they they bet in for a month or two or a year or two and then and something else comes along and it all restarts again how do you work with your executive colleagues and other parties to ensure that 
we get 10 years commitment to 10x and we get time for the economic recovery plan to bet in because economic recovery takes time and it takes continuity as well as flexibility and to me these strategies need to be given a chance um, the second point um, you talked about silo mentality and how that has to end and that's cross departmental and through the executive but it also filters down to local government local government has important economic regeneration powers especially in encouraging entrepreneurship and start business programs how do we ensure that the economic recovery plan fits in with the strategies of the 11 councils and make sure that there's a continuity of purpose in there so that we, it does trickle down and have a positive impact um that's all for me at this stage um, thank you it's okay if I go ahead, sure, yeah. yeah. Thank you, um, John, um, for those. Um, yes, I mean, the issues of, of, of bringing women back into the workplace, the issues um, of getting um, an environment where women will be able to come back into the workplace are, are massively important. And it doesn't matter what those barriers are for women in the workplace, whether that is childcare, whether that is poor experience of education, whether that is maybe um, um, issues around abuse or, or, or issues that are really, really difficult um, to address. These are challenges that we all must do because if we are, again, to create a stable, prosperous Northern Ireland, we really must uh, ensure that women are central uh, to that and in the workplace. Um, I just want to be... Um, as a, as a bit of an aside, um, direct you uh, to the work we're doing for women in science um, and engineering um, and the work um, that we have, have launched at that hub uh, to try to ensure that young women um, and women from all ages and all backgrounds um, can engage in all parts of the workplace. So we don't just want women in the workplace doing traditional things. We want women in the workplace challenging um, and actually doing um, and in, the, in the broadest spectrum of the workplace that we're doing. And we have um, many of our, our, our really important companies who have committed um, to working um, to help women to get into the STEM subjects, engineering, science, um, and to help uh, that aspects um, of equality uh, within the workplace. So really, really important. Continuity of message and vision is, is, is massively important um, as well. I don't expect the fundamentals of this message to change uh, in any shape or form. We need to create a world-class economy. We can't do that by doing the same things that we have always done over and over again. I believe that this 10x economy document Actually, that decade of innovation gives us the step change, the ability to do that. And I know that um, that will require the continuity of message around um, really challenging how we do things. Um, but it will also require a little bit of flexibility and it will require buy-in right across um, departments within the executive. And that is why it will become part of that recovery programme, part of that programme for government. Um, and that's important. You mentioned um, both local government and indeed I do want to also mention Enterprise NI. I believe that an innovative economy is an economy in which every part of that economy can be innovative. Um, and I have some absolutely amazing examples of um, small firms using um, the um, vouchers, uh, the innovation vouchers um, through Invest NI to work um, with our local universities and are now selling product from that research and innovation journey. So innovation is not just for the big uh, firms, it's not for the ones that you and I expect, it is also for all of those, and I will be working with our enterprise agencies to ensure that innovation is inclusive and can uh, be and is for everyone as part of the growing economy. Thank you, Minister, and can we bring Gary into the spotlight and can I just ask members to try and keep their questions um, succinct and direct so that we can get through all members and, and then we will bring people back in for further questions if they wish. Okay, thanks Chair uh, and thanks Minister for uh, your update this morning. Uh, obviously I was delighted that you came to Londonderry and, and you met with uh, the Londonderry Chamber and Catalyst as well and I was 
Uh, pleased to see uh, the endorsement from the likes of um, Steve Orr, uh, who obviously has a lot of experience, but uh, you know, I, I hear a lot of words at times uh, f from members, but the fact is that the likes of Steve Orr is putting his words into action uh, and looking to expand in the North West. And I think that's very welcome. And the support that you have given uh, personally, Minister, to the likes of Catalyst who are, are expanding in the North West, I think that's to be uh, commendment or commended. Uh, the, the strong endorsements that we've seen from the various uh, private sectors is very welcome. And I think, Chair, it would be useful if we could hear from some of those uh, those who have endorsed this plan uh, at a future committee meeting. I think that would be useful. Uh, just in terms of the question, uh, Minister, obviously you have the, uh, the 10X economy vision, you have your recovery action plan, you have the city deal and growth deals, which have been ruled out across Northern Ireland. How do you see those three uh, visions, those three plans coming together? And how do we ensure that there's, there's no duplication, uh, but also that it's going to be delivering the way across Northern Ireland? Thank you. Um, and thank you for facilitating the visit um, up to London Derry um, last couple of weeks ago now. Um, delight to be at Catalyst, um, to hear of their expansion plans, to know that they are absolutely chock a block full, um, and that innovation, entrepreneurship, and a growing economy is alive and well um, in the Northwest, and uh, that we will uh, be continuing to support that. Also, really delighted to go down and uh, talk to those who were uh, looking at the Foy Eden project. I think that that kind of international brand um, and that kind of exciting environmental project um, has huge potential uh, in the Northwest, and I'll be delighted to work with you. Um, on all of those issues um, as, as we uh, try to take them forward. So that's that's massively important as well. Um, it, 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 it is useful um, always to go out and talk to industry um, and to you know talk to different parts um, of uh, our regional economy. Um, and despite sometimes some of the pessimism that I hear, I know that many in the business community are excited by the opportunity, and that's what 10X gives them, the vision and the opportunity, and to know that government will actually work with them um, in order uh, to deliver that. Um, we um, want um, to do that, and, and we want to do that really, really positively um, with you. Um, I'll ask maybe Michelle or Paul to come in um, on any other aspects of the question that um, they uh, want to, or maybe even Victor, which one wants to go first? Uh, for me to start, yeah. I'm going to pick up on the specifics of ERA. I, I think, um, Gary, it's, it's essential that the, the depots that you mentioned there, so the recovery action plan and tenets and city deals, uh, are part of our singular economic policy response to both COVID, but also to the mega trends and the adjustments that need to happen into the economy. So, in the, in the timeline, the economic recovery action plan is those immediate responses that are required as the economy reopens and adjusts to the next 12 months. That has to dovetail into that longer term vision uh, as quickly as possible. And, and interventions that happen through the course of this year need to give us strong focus on the in the future. And the City deals is essential um, to this in the region of 1.5 billion coming into the line and maybe in your part of the world that means something like 200 million. Um, making that relevant to 10x and ERAP is those digital technology uh, projects through Seizure and Carl and then the life science over the exact type of interventions that we need to be bringing forward to establish that capacity and capability to it to, to drive innovation over that top tier, but also diffuse innovation throughout the, the economy, uh, whether, it, whether that's in the Northwest or throughout the Northern Ireland. Michelle, do you want to add anything about the ERAP interventions? Well, well, certainly what I would say is those documents absolutely do talk to each other, and it's essential that, that they do. Um, I almost see the ERAP as the boost on top of normal business activity that we require this year and, and hopefully next and, and, and beyond to respond to those very immediate impacts um, of the COVID pandemic. So, for example, um, you referred to city growth deals there. That is absolutely reflected uh, and runs through the Economic Recovery Action Plan. Um, and an action within that recovery action plan um, is to boost the city deals in response um, to the economic hardships that have been experienced over the last 14 months. 
as a result of COVID. And as Paul said, there, there, there's a broad range of interventions within the Economic Recovery Action Plan, um, some of which will fall away as we move, as we swing back towards um, a more normalised economy going forward. Um, but a number of those interventions will remain as the footholds of the economic community moving forward. Um, so in, in short, absolutely agree, those three strands need to work together um, and we have engineered them so that they do so. Guy, can I just possibly add as well that, that not that um, not, well, maybe a couple of months ago now, um, I signed off on some of the strategic outline business cases um, for the growth deal uh, for the Northwest, um, and they are progressing uh, in the normal way. It was basically the ends of terms um, for that deal actually being signed as well. And um, some, obviously, the Belfast deal is, is, is a bit ahead. It's just been around a bit longer. Um, but some of those represent really, really strategic interventions in the economy that will actually tie in superbly well to the 10x vision um, and will be the step change that is needed to actually make that economy uh, function um, at a level that we needed to do and not just to keep on. We don't want to keep on doing the same thing. We want to make the economy different, better and provide opportunity. Thank you. Um, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Good morning, Minister, um, and thank you very much for your briefing this morning. And um, I welcome the 10X vision document. I think there's a lot to, uh, to welcome in it. I agree with the technologies that are, are set out there, the eight uh, Pacific areas. The clusters are, I would say, spot on as well. Uh, it is certainly a direction of travel to be commended. Um, and I suppose... Um, I would say, you know, the desire to create a world class economy is, um, is very much welcome and it's an ambition that is held by many regions and many countries throughout the world. Uh, and, you know, I'm looking at this document to see what our differentiation is, what is our Pacific uh, offer? And I suppose, um, you know, I don't want the document to look like any other document. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, what is a beautiful South song. It could be Rotterdam or anywhere, Liverpool or Rome. I want this to be a very Northern Ireland document that, that speaks to people here. And therefore, I, I want to know how it marries um, with the structural difficulties that we've held in this place for decades. You know, we can all have big, hairy, um, audacious goals, but we really need to anchor them in the current reality. And the current reality is that we have got, you know, structural difficulties here. And I'm speaking specifically about skills uh, and the challenge uh, and the mountain that we have to climb. And I'm also speaking about the regional imbalance. And you, you'll not uh, be surprised at all that, that I uh, am concerned that, you know, in, in the multitude, I suppose, of, of plans and visions and, and frameworks, um, the, the regional imbalance is not dressed, addressed adequately as well as the skills imbalance. You know, the one thing that will make every plan work is our people. And we've got to invest in our people. We've got to prevent our people from leaving here and never coming back. And we've got to encourage those that we did let go to come back and contribute to our economy and to the well-being um, of um, this place that we call home. So um, those are the things that are that are not jumping out of, uh, at me in this plan. Uh, and I want just to ask you today, you know, Minister, where are the real goals in relation to skills and regional balance? Uh, and are we really maximising um, the... the um, the, the area that we can compete in and that we can have a differentiation and that is uh, around the protocol and how we have a foot uh, into particular economic uh, pathways uh, within the UK, obviously, but within uh, the EU markets as well. So um, just if you could speak to those uh, particular points um, at the moment and obviously uh, in relation to the Northwest, we have a 10,000 student um, uh, ambition 
action that needs to be realised uh, and it's it's not jumping out of any of those plans at the moment uh, as a pathway. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to be left behind in the Northwest. And I'm glad that you were down uh, and you met my former colleagues in the Chamber of Commerce and that, um, you know, all of us have ambitions and we all want to grow and we want to employ more people and, and grow our economy. But we need investment um, in our uh, infrastructure and our skills infrastructure and our university in order to do that. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things um, really from uh, that, uh, Sinead. Um, first of all, um, I'm, I'm glad that you broadly welcomed the document. I think that there is nothing to be afraid in this document. It, it, is, it, is, it is a challenge um, to all of us. It will be a challenge to this department, to the executive. It will be a challenge to business. Um, and it will be a challenge to all of us as to how we actually take this place forward. Can I say um, one of the reasons for, for we, we want to get this um, document out, we want discussion and we want the plans and, and, and the vision um, distilled into that is that as we recover from COVID, many, many companies are doing exactly the same thing. We need to be out of it. We need to be setting out our stall um, as um, a, a, a growing economy and as an ambitious economy. And if we don't do that and we don't do it early, those who are out earliest will get the best returns. So it's really, really important um, that we were able to produce this and do it at speed. Uh, what differentiates us um, from and what differentiates from other economies um, across the world? We are already world leaders in some of the areas that we um, have mentioned within the document. We are a world leader in cybersecurity. We are one of the best places to invest um, for tech firms across the world. Um, we are and will have, as we finish and, and, and work through Project Stratum, one of the best connected economies in, in the whole of the world. And those are absolutely amazing things that help us and will continue to help us to be world class. When I talk to investors um, who are considering Northern Ireland as an investment destination, they mention constantly to me the skills of our people and the collaboration between university and business that is really important. And increasingly, they are mentioning the clusters and the excitement and the innovation within those clusters um, in their sector. And that also differentiates us and makes us world class. But we don't want to stop there. We can be better and we can rise um, up in such a range of areas. And that's what this is about. The document does have chapters on skills and on place and on regional balance because that is important. It is important to me that we create a Northern Ireland and a Northern Ireland economy that has opportunity for all. No matter where you live or what you do or what your aspirations are, that you can find your place in that economy and have uh, your right to a job, to an education, to ongoing skills, to a good quality of life. So that is fundamental to the vision and fundamental to where we want to go. Skills, I think anybody and everybody in the committee will have heard me over the last year and I've answered quite a bit on skills um, and we will continue to ensure that is absolutely fundamental to the growth of the economy going forward. Thank you, Minister. And just again to uh, remind members, we, we do have still a number of members to get through, so we can keep um, questions as succinct as possible. Can we bring Claire in, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, Minister, can I just say thank you for uh, attending Windsor Park yesterday with the Irish Football Association. Um, I think that leads quite nicely into the conversation we're having about cross-departmental working. And people might wonder why the Minister for the Economy is, is going to, to talk to people uh, at football. But I think that points to that their interest 
change and what they can do for employability. Um, which does very much fall within your remit. Um, I, I do appreciate your comments in terms of recognising that your 10-year vision has to be cross-department uh, and cross-agency, and I think that means also widening up the stakeholders that we approach in relation to this, hence IFA and my comments in relation to that. Um, I think your 10-year your vision, like other uh, kind of 10-year programmes, uh, Bangoa, for example, is um, realistic and sensible, but a lot of uh, the work that needs to happen needs to happen in the short term as well as the long term vision that you're uh, talking about. Um, you know, so I'd be keen to hear what you know you envisage happening in the next number of years, and I appreciate you know you may not be in that role, um, you know, even just because we have an election next year, not least because what's happening within your own party. But you know, how, how do you encourage that and, and put it into a wider program for government that hopefully we'll be looking at next year and get back to 2016, where it is about outcomes based accountability and it is recognising that each department doesn't have their own set of aims, but everything has to uh, kind of come together. Also want to talk to innovation. Um, you know, I've been badgering you about trying to create a hemp industry in Northern Ireland, but I think it's those types of things that we have to look at in the context of 2021, in the context of climate change, and the opportunities that exist in Northern Ireland because of our own specific circumstances, but also because of what the rest of the world is doing. So, you know, I'd be keen to hear your, your thoughts in relation to all of those things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Claire, thank you. Um, and again, it, it was it was great to, to go down to Winter Park yesterday um, and talk um, about opportunity, um, about skills, and about increasing um, and young people's uh, employability prospects uh, with uh, the the guys there. Um, I I I have personal experience of how this. Um, type of program actually positively impacts on young people. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great job, and, and we have um, outlined a few actions that we will take forward from that meeting um, and hopefully help them uh, not just to continue to, but to expand what they can do. Sport is one of those things where I think uh, many young people, even if they, they haven't had a great experience of education, um, sport is a great um, binder in society, um, but it's also a great um, opportunity. And many of those young people who have been through those programs have found um, opportunity, have found confidence, um, and indeed the ability um, to go on and to progress um, into careers. Um, and so it is uh, great work that we're happy to support. Um, how um, can we get um, some of the short-term measures that is why it is so important that we have the Economic Recovery Action Plan, we have the City and Growth Days, we have the vision. We want to create a vision, but underneath, we want to create all the kinds of, of um, short-term actions that we can do to actually try to help people uh, back into work. And that's why the Economic Recovery Action Plan, for example, is so important. Um, that plan devotes around um, 30 million um, to additional skills in the next year, additional skills programs. Um, that's why um, many of the companies who come to Northern Ireland, it's, it's a short term action, it's a really flexible, quick intervention in the economy. But one of the programs that I am really most proud of in this department are the Assured Skills Academies. Um, and they are absolutely brilliant. And, and indeed, we have companies who have come and based themselves in Northern Ireland because of the Assured Skills programmes and that opportunity to take young people, to help them to grow and develop um, within the Assured Skills programme, but that it is job and industry focused um, at the end of it. And, and that is a huge thing. So those are the kind of things that we want to accelerate over the next year. Obviously, city and growth days give us kind of a more medium term um, element um, of recovery. And you will know um, from city and growth days, um, indeed in the northwest, the Causeway Coast and Glens, much of that will be around tourism um, and around um, how we build both infrastructure for tourism and how we build skills um, within uh, the tourism uh, industry. And again, it isn't just about um, one uh, element of it, it's about all three. Um, and indeed, innovation 
and keeping up with global trends, and that's what this document is, is, is absolutely focused on. Um, Michelle, do you want to come in on any elements of the Economic Recovery Action Plan that are, are uh, central to the kind of short-term interventions? Well, really just to, to echo and reinforce, Minister, uh, what you've said there about how important skills is as a pillar of the Economic Recovery Action Plan. Um, the difficulty um, in, in crafting an Economic Recovery Action Plan is the short term nature of it um, and as people will understand a lot of our skills interventions run beyond the, uh, this initial financial year and um, so within that there, there is a mixture of very short sharp interventions and um, to upskill and, and, and keep those individuals close to the labour market who have been most impacted by the pandemic which uh, as has been demonstrated today has been more harshly felt within our younger people uh, and females within the workforce and um, there are also those longer term um, in initiatives almost that step change that, that policy that was developing within the department and we will need as a department to consider then how those continue um, through the thread of the 10x economy um, vision document as well um, and, and, and how they are funded going forward but really to just to echo that skills is it's such an important component of our economic recovery now and our growth beyond the time frame of the economic recovery action plan thank you michelle um, can we bring marvin into the spotlight please just fell off. oh okay Have we lost marvin okay we'll come back to marvin then can we bring john o'dowd into the spotlight please Uh, you're on mute, John. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for your presentation thus far. Minister, you read out a list of endorsements at the start of the meeting of your uh, strategy, and you also have set up a number of stakeholder groups uh, which miss an important voice in any economic strategy or any economic recovery, and that's the voice of workers. Nowhere can I see a serious attempt to engage with the trade union movement to uh, be part of your plan for the economic recovery of our society, which I think is a huge gap because there cannot be an economy without workers. So, Minister, what's different in this plan from the previous 10 years of your predecessors, which has seen us with the lowest economic productivity, the lowest economic activity, the lowest wages and the lowest living standards of anywhere in this, in these islands. So what, what, what's new? What has changed? And the other point I want to make is, in the absence of the voice of those workers who are worried about how to pay their mortgage, their rent, uh, they and their families are concerned about the, what the future holds for them, what is in this document for them? And finally, uh, the media has reported this morning that Minister Poots has boycotted yet another North-South Ministerial Council meeting in relation to agriculture. Given the importance of agriculture and the agri-food industry to our economy, surely the, the continuing boycotting of North-South Ministerial Council meetings is doing more damage to our economy than any glossy document will do for the recovery of our economy. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, can I first of all just say that this isn't just another glossy document. Um, this is a vision for the Northern Ireland economy. This is about trying to challenge the things that we have done in the past that haven't worked because we're still in the lower uh, percentage of those small global economies. And challenge us, challenge ourselves, challenge everybody as to how we can actually increase economic activity, economic output and economic prosperity um, for everybody across Northern Ireland. So I don't want it to be seen in that way. I'm not that interested in glossy documents for the sake of them. There are plenty of them hanging around Stormont that have been there for a very long time. I want a challenge, a step change and a new vision for the Northern Ireland economy. And I believe that this document gives us that. Um, which is uh, hugely, hugely important. Um, the issues um, around uh, trade unions, and of course the trade unions are an exceptionally important part um, of the Northern Ireland the Stakeholder Engagement Forum that we engage with on a regular basis as we develop policy and as we respond to issues. 
They will, of course, be always central to that. And as we continue, not just to set out the vision, but as we continue to work um, on the steps needed to take that vision, we will, of course, ensure that there is a very wide range of stakeholders uh, within uh, that uh, forum and who are consulted within uh, that uh, vision and the steps that we would take. Uh, in order to do it. And it is important. It's also important, really, um, if we're going to publish a document about the economy, that we do get the endorsement of people who are leading um, within different uh, sectors of the economy. That is massively important. And I think it is a credit to the department, to the officials that have worked on this document, and to the way that we have engaged, that there is such a wide range of endorsements and support for a vision for the Northern Ireland uh, economy. So that is what has changed within the document. Um, and that is how I see it. And I'm not interested in the stereotype documents of the past. I want to make this different. I want to make it um, inclusive. Um, and I want to ensure that it creates economic opportunity for all, because that way we will have stable, peaceful Northern Ireland. Um, in relation to the North-South Ministerial meetings, um, you will, of course, know um, the issues around um, the protocol, etc. I don't know what was on the agenda for the meeting, uh, but I think we can all agree, um, and this vision document um, sets out um, that um, our agri-food sector, and particularly how we can make agri-food more competitive, productive, um, how we can overcome the challenges for agri-food of the protocol um, is all massively important as we go forward. And of course, that's reflected in the fact that we've actually given a separate document um, and a separate piece of work um, to um, our agri-food uh, review, um, which I hope uh, we will hear um, an outcome from, um, maybe even an interim report um, by the end of the summer. Um, and that Sir Peter Kendall and the team that he is working with them will provide us with very specific actions that we need to take in order to grow the agri-food sector um, of the economy. Um, and of course, the importance, the absolute centrality that it has, um, I think, not just to rural Northern Ireland, but to our values um, and our way of life. To pick up on that point, there's only cursory mention within the vision document and also within, within the action plan of um, the new trading arrangements post-Brexit. Um, I think there's no mention of cross-border trade, despite the fact that that has grown year on year for the past 20-odd years um, since the Good Friday Agreement, and we've seen huge increases in North-South and South-North trade since the beginning of this year. So is it a case of, I guess, politics getting in the way of the economic um, opportunities of the all island economy and our potential to, uh, under our potential un, uh, under of our status under the protocol. Uh, sure. Oh. Oh. oh dear. Economy, there is no such thing. We are competing economies, but we are neighbours, um, and we need um, also to um, help each other, to trade with each other, to work with each other, to be good neighbours to each other. Um, and that is absolutely important. And I think I demonstrate that um, week in, week out uh, in this department uh, by the work uh, that I do. I will remind the committee again, and it's an incontrovertible fact, that we do more business um, with uh, the rest of the United Kingdom and within the UK's internal market than we do with every other part of the world, including the Republic of Ireland, added together. And that is why it is so central to actually uh, ensure that we have unfettered trade within the UK's internal market, that we are able to um, take part um, in those global opportunities um, that uh, the UK's um, international trade policy uh, will bring uh, for us. And I will continue to work to ensure that that happens. This isn't about the politics of the protocol. This is about a vision for everyone in the Northern Ireland economy. Can I bring Mervyn into the spotlight, please? 
And apologies, Mervyn, I think you dropped out. You were actually supposed to be in before John, so just apologies for that. That's okay, thank you. I think it was maybe due to my connection uh, than anything else. Minister, you're very welcome and uh, appreciate all that you've said already. And obviously, despite some comments that have been made recently about your reluctance to attend the committee, I think it's, uh, we know that you have always been willing to engage with the committee. So as, as a, a younger member of the committee, only in duration of being attendance at the committee, not in any do with my age, uh, I'm glad that, uh, that you're here. I have to say, you know, it's true that success has many fathers and failure is an orphan. And given the comments that have been made, particularly by the chair yesterday in an article in the Irish News, uh, when uh, you were accused of not doing enough during the pandemic, I want to say that many businesses in my constituency welcome, and I was speaking to one of them yesterday, welcome what has been done by your department to ensure that those people that John refers to actually have a job this morning, actually have a future for their family, and actually have security as we move out of the pandemic. But you mentioned the innovation vouchers, and I want to maybe just tease us out a wee bit more. There's a, a business, as you know, and you visited my constituency in Ballycastle, who are world-leading, world-class uh, a collaboration between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. So it, proves, it disproves this myth that there's somehow some political issue that we have with working with uh, colleagues, friends uh, in the Irish Republic. But the innovation voucher scheme was essential to that particular business in Ballycastle, who are now in the process of looking at building a factory to employ more people in, our con in my constituency. Do you see a, a role as to how we can ensure that we roll that out in a way which is beneficial to small, medium companies, which are probably at this minute in time have other ideas, but would like to test them in a way that they could bring them forward and into the marketplace? Yeah, um, thank you, Mervyn. Um, and just a, a, a second on the pandemic response. This department um, actually has provided almost half a billion pounds um, in uh, support um, for businesses throughout the pan pandemic, tens of thousands of businesses throughout the pandemic. It has been absolutely essential in keeping those businesses alive, keeping them afloat in incredibly difficult times. But we must not also forget that the United Kingdom government has spent um, well, um, I think it must be almost now around four billion, maybe more, in relation to those national schemes that it has provided, as well as the additional COVID response funds that have been provided to um, the Northern Ireland executive. That is the value of the United Kingdom and the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, the second uh, thing that I want to say, and you know, I, I, I think that this company that we're talking about, Mervyn, um, is one of the classic examples of how a small, innovative, entrepreneurial company based in Valley Castle can have an idea in response to the pandemic, go and receive an innovation voucher from Invest NI, work with Ulster University and currently are producing um, their product for sale um, in the marketplace and considering expanding. So the point you make is, and, and this company is an absolute brilliant uh, demonstration of how innovation isn't just for big multinationals or very large companies in Northern Ireland. Innovation can be inclusive. It can be for every small company within the economy as well. And this company is an absolute um, brilliant demonstration of that. And I want to work with our enterprise agencies to make sure that that innovation is inclusive. Um, and I really look forward to going back up to Valley Castle um, and seeing how the firm have progressed since this last, well, I suppose it was really about this time last year. Um, that we went uh, to see them during uh, the pandemic when they had an idea um, and um, they've turned that idea into a product with the help um, of innovation um, at Ulster University. And what this also shows is that every company, no matter what their size, can actually be part of innovation and be part of that collaboration with research um, and innovation that goes on in our universities. And I talk to many people who are potential investors for Northern Ireland. And one of the things they, they talk about over and over again 
is the collaboration between universities and um, business and how that collaboration helps them to take their business forward and we want to see more of that because that's the practical outwork of uh, innovation and research. Thanks Minister. Can we bring Christopher into the spotlight please? <laughs> Hello, how are you? Um, good to have you, Minister, in, in front of the committee. Uh, just before I ask my a couple of questions that I have, I have to say, um, I think there's been some rewriting of history taking place because there was nobody but nobody uh, more political over the course of the last three years than those that spent three years arguing for a protocol that actively harms the Northern Ireland economy and it doesn't provide us with this myth of the best of both worlds. But I have no intention of getting into that beyond stating to those who are annoyed about um, North-South ministerial events, uh, we as a party have made it very, very clear we're opposed to the protocol and we will have no part in implementing the protocol. So if you want us at all North-South ministerial councils, there will be no protocol-related business at them because, uh, as I say, we will not be uh, a party to implementing um, any part of this undemocratic protocol. Um, Minister, can I ask you, in terms of Northern Ireland's place in the world, do you think it's realistic to say that we can become like a small elite economy in a world context? Oh, sorry. I believe in Northern Ireland and I believe in its people. And it's absolutely vital that we provide the vision and the policy direction that will help us to become that small elite economy that has a nation in the world. And that's what this document's about. It's about focusing on core and key strengths and allowing us to develop those core and key strengths. And as I said, we are already world leading. We already were leading. If, if people come to Northern Ireland from across, um, you know, from across North America, for example, because of our expertise and leading edge uh, technologies around cybersecurity. They come because of the skills of our people. They come because of the clusters that we're creating and the innovation and the the excitement of those clusters. And they also come because we are also building the infrastructure. You notice that a number of companies recently where we've announced uh, jobs, and they're here because of the connectivity of our um, communities. And Project Strata um, is, is hugely uh, important. It will deliver um, broadband um, at um, as acceptable as to 76,000 homes across Northern Ireland. Um, but we already are a well-connected um, community and um, some of these companies can have working from home policies, they can have the flexibility that they need while they still have the skills and the tremendous work ethic um, of uh, the Northern Ireland people. So this is hugely important, hugely exciting, and the vision helps us to lead the way. Do either of my, any of my colleagues want to come in in response to the, any further? No, they don't. Thank you. Uh, um, can I say as well to you, Diane, I know, um, not only just from the public audiences, but I know, that in terms of the executive, there was no one um, who pushed harder in terms of trying to get our economy open and trying to get our economy back up and running um, in the context of um, trying to stimulate growth over the course of the last 16 or 17 months. Um, could I ask just in that, I know that there are some decisions uh, due to be made um, tomorrow by the executive in terms of easements. I think that's the case. One of the things that has been raised with me isn't directly related to this issue, but I wanted to this document, but I wanted to flag it up. Um, small cafe owners in my constituency have been in touch with me about basically getting uh, fully open um, as soon as possible. Um, particular uh, a guy that operates a business on the on the Woodstock Road, and I know that you've been a, an advocate 
for small businesses in the executive. And can I ask you just to raise that issue in terms of trying to get um, small businesses like that um, in, the, in that particular sector open as quickly as possible because I know they, they really, they're chomping at the bit and they want to get open certainly in advance of the summertime. Um, I, absolutely. Um, I, it is, it's not a secret that um, I have um, been um, calling for some time um, for the, the reopening and the freeing up of the economy. Um, I had originally proposed the small cafe owners should have been able to open along with retail um, because uh, because it's the way we it's the way we work it's the way we do business. I'm sure many of you will recognise my Saturday afternoon, which is probably a dand around the shops um, and um, maybe a cup of coffee with friends. Um, and the climate here in Northern Ireland, and for many small um, cafe owners, that's impossible if they can only operate outside. I'm hopeful that, and I am thankful, first of all, for the decrease in the transmission of the virus. I am thankful and hugely excited by the fact that we have a tremendous uh, vaccine rollout program, which is providing protection against the virus. And I'm also thankful um, for the huge sacrifices that people have made personally in their own family lives um, and being cut off from their families, but also um, within uh, the business community as well. I hope that we will see um, that easement um, that we have, because I think all of those numbers um, are in a good place. If I had one uh, issue that I want to raise in relation just to general reopening, it is actually the issue around the current guidance that we have around the common travel area. So currently we are the only part of the United Kingdom that uh, indicates that if you come to Northern Ireland that you should isolate for 10 days. This has been a, a factor that has prohibited many family and friends from coming back and meeting in Northern Ireland, but it also hugely impacts on our tourism um, industry. We currently have a um, GB um, marketing um, program ready to, to roll out within GB, but of course it is impossible to do that while uh, we uh, see uh, the guidance remain as it is. Now, we currently um, are around the same as other parts of the United Kingdom with um, our numbers in relation to the virus. And if I was looking for an easement that I think that would impact hugely on the economy and how we take it forward over the summer, I would have to say that that guidance um, is providing huge difficulties for tourism and hospitality and indeed uh, prevents us from marketing within GB. Thanks, Minister. Um, we have three members wanting to come back in for brief questions, so if they keep them brief, um, hopefully you'll be able to get through them all before you have to leave. So, John Stewart, John O'Dowd, and then Sinead, but if you want to bring John Stewart in, first of all. Yeah, thanks, Chair, for coming back in. Um, Minister, I just want to echo your comments regarding our enterprise agencies. It would be remiss of me not to do so. As you know, I'm the Chair of the Micro and Small Business APG, and we're, we're actually meeting this afternoon to discuss the 10X vision and the recovery plan. So I'll, I'll happily, if you want, feedback any thoughts on the APG to yourself and your department officials as well. Um, just on one of the cornerstones of the recovery plan is obviously the high street stimulus package through the voucher scheme. And we discussed this last week about the real need to drive as much as possible towards our independent and indigenous businesses in Northern Ireland. Just keen to get a feel for how you plan to do that. Thanks, Minister. Um, yes, uh, John, and um, happy we had a, a really good uh, meeting with uh, the group um, on um, enterprise and small businesses and happy to go back at another stage um, to talk about the 10x vision. I think that's really important. Um, the High Street Stimulus Scheme is one of those cornerstones of our, our short-term economic recovery plan. Um, and it is the only, um, we are the only region of the United Kingdom um, that is offering that scheme. The scheme um, is now at procurement stage um, with uh, the, the people who will operate or whoever's going to operate. So it's at procurement stage. Um, we've done some research 
um, and are clear that um, given that there is pent up demand um, at the moment, we haven't been in the shops in about four and a half months, so there's a bit of pent up demand that we should continue the stimulus for the high street by rolling it out um, perhaps at the start of the autumn. So that, that's where we see um, the high street stimulus scheme going out. You're absolutely right that it then is really important to work very, very closely with local chambers, local businesses and so on, so that we get out the message that this is about supporting local businesses and local people who have invested in our community um, and continue to stimulate demand for them. So we will be rolling out a very local, shop local campaign around the High Street Stimulus Scheme. Uh, Minister, just quickly, I'd raised this with your officials last week, but I just want the opportunity to raise it with yourself in relation to the High Street Voucher Scheme. There are concerns that those workers who are falling on hard times and have lost their jobs, who are now on benefits, may be penalised by the fact that if they claim the High Street Voucher Scheme, it will be classed as income and therefore their benefits will be impacted on. Is this something that can be actively looked at within your department and a solution found to that problem? Um, I, I, at, at this, John, I, this, I have, this hasn't reached me, um, but I'm really happy to look at it and come back to you. I don't think it is income, um, but um, we're happy to look at it and come back to you. Yeah, Minister, if I just come in, so uh, at an official level, we've engaged with colleagues in the uh, BBP, the Department of Working Pensions, HM Treasury, and also HMRC to make sure that this is not an issue for the scheme. And that level of engagement continues to ensure that um, issues don't come up uh, as we roll out the delivery. Because it's absolutely not the intention for that to be a problem for those individuals that you, that you mentioned. Thanks for that, Paul. Thanks, Minister. And can we bring Sinead in very quickly? Uh, thank you, Chair, for, for me coming in here. Uh, Minister, uh, I really welcomed your uh, words in relation to supporting women through recovery. Uh, and I, I too, uh, I'm a bit of a feminist uh, and uh, I'm seeking to help support women through recovery. And one of the things throughout all of the recovery plans that is really missing, and I know it's not essentially in your remit or your portfolio, but it is certainly a labour market um, uh, intervention that is required, and that is looking um, at childcare. If we do not have the right childcare policy in place, we have 50% of our workforce um, having difficulties accessing the economy, and it is having an impact on our economic inactivity, uh, and it's leaving a lot of people outside um, of, of the, the economy and supporting the economy and driving productivity. And I would like you, as the Economy Minister, to really get a handle around that and work with your colleague uh, in the Minister, the Minister of Education in order to drive that childcare policy strategy so that we can support women in real fundamental ways uh, in relation to um, supporting their children and looking after their welfare uh, in the early years. Um, thank you. I absolutely agree, Sinead. Um, Childcare um, is massively important, not just to women, but to families um, and to enable them um, to be a part uh, of the economy and currently um, and it never fails to surprise me that the cost of childcare for families is absolutely huge um, and often prevents uh, either parent um, or indeed a parent uh, from being part of the workplace. And I will, um, and I will always work with executive colleagues who have responsibility for this because it is one of those impediments um, to the labour market. When we are maybe talking about, and, and maybe just to, to indicate, um, and uh, I do apologise, Chair, Chair, but after this, I, I do have to go because I have a huge range of other things um, that have to be done today. Um, but also to indicate this morning that um, I have announced that um, we are going to have a pilot scheme in higher education uh, to try to alleviate period po poverty, um, which I think also is one of those huge issues um, for uh, young women um, in Northern Ireland. So we will be announcing further details of that over the day. 
Minister, thanks for your time this morning. And actually, that that is a very welcome announcement in relation to period poverty. It's an issue I know a number of members have been um, uh, campaigning on for for some time. So we look forward to hearing the detail on that. But thank you to yourself and to Michelle and Paul and Victor for joining us this morning and for um, giving us the the update in relation to the various work that are plans and strategies that are being brought through the department. So um, thank you very much, uh, members. We will. Peter wants to uh, come in just in relation to potentially looking at an event around the uh, economic vision plan. Yeah, Chair, we, we'd already talked a little bit about um, organising an event uh, around a few themes, including the High Street Vouchers, the original Economic Recovery Action Plan. But if members are content, we, we lever the 10x vision into that as well. Um, just, just so that we have more full coverage and also um, to, to give our stakeholders an opportunity to talk about that kind of projection forward um, that the, the plan has about looking at um, sorting out some of the, the structural issues that the committee had identified in its macroeconomic micro-inquiry. So if members are content, we'll roll this, this into it as well. And we're hoping to get that done. Um, we have a date in June in mind, um, but we will, we will come back with more details. Okay, so unless members want to come in on any specific points on anything discussed this morning, um, we'll move on to matters arising. Sinead, you're on mute. Sorry, Chair, can I just come in for, for a second here? Um, you know, it, it was great having the, the Minister here this morning, but I do regret that she hasn't been here um, at all in 2021. Uh, and I think as a committee, she needs to be here more regularly and, um, and through yourself, um, Chair. It's important that we um, put in at least a monthly call that, that, with the minister uh, to come and address the committee. There is major issues that need to be discussed at every level, um, and you know the protocol, the, the, the economic recovery, now the vision plan. We seem to be kind of like a, a committee that catches up after everybody else does. So. Um, and after announcements are made, and I don't think that that's good enough. It doesn't allow us in scrutiny. You know that is of value. Um, it really is retrospective um, scrutiny, which is not uh, constructive at all. Um, somebody else was chair. in as well. Yeah, chair. Uh, sorry, Mervyn. Christopher, then Mervyn. Sorry. Okay, thank you, thank you. chair. Can I just ask? It is my understanding that every single request that has been put to the Minister by this committee for a meeting or for her to come before this committee has been acceded to. Now, if that's the case, then the criticism isn't, and I'm not criticising you, Chair, but the criticism doesn't lie with the Minister for not being here often enough. It perhaps lies with us for not asking her to be here often enough. Yes, Christopher, that, that is correct, that the Minister has attended when asked, and as members will know, we have a very hefty agenda, we have a very broad remit, and an awful lot of people that we do want to talk to, um, and members agree the forward work programme, as it's put to them regularly by the, the committee staff, so it, it is for members to request more be briefings if that's what they wish, but it's also, uh, we have to be mindful of the fact that we do want to talk to as many other people as well. Uh, as the minister, so that we are able to adequately scrutinise the work of the department. I think Mervyn was looking to come in there as well. Yeah, Chair, just to, to endorse what has been said by Christopher, I think we need to be careful uh, as a former minister to departments. I know the demands, and if we're going to set the benchmark for the economy minister, that she appears every month, then there's other ministers, and I think we'll need to have a long look at their diary because they too have been very. Uh, poor in terms of their response, or I just caution. There's nothing that the committee has asked hasn't been responded to in terms of officials, information, and even in relation to the minister. So let's. I think we need to try and understand the difficulties that all our ministers have in terms of their diary. Sinead did also raise, while I may disagree with her on that issue, I too agree with her on the issue that she raised about childcare, and it might be useful for us to get from the department and obviously we can't, we can't write to the education minister but we could maybe write to the education committee and try and get some sense of where does that issue really sit at the moment in terms of provision collaboratively between the department of the economy and the department of education yeah, thank I you 
happy to do that, Mervyn. Um, I think it's a really important issue, and as members have reflected in their own contributions, it, it's critical in terms of getting people back into the workplace and as a barrier um, to you know not only women but mostly women in, in accessing um, the workplace at times. So um, I think that would be a really timely thing to do, Peter, if we can. Sure, we'll take that forward, yeah. Okay. Okay, unless members have any other points that they want to raise, we'll move on. Okay. Chair, just to flag up to members, um, I'm, I'm just forwarding now to your emails uh, the departmental press release uh, on period poverty that the Minister just mentioned. So if you want to have a look out for that, it's coming through now. Thank you, Peter. So moving on then, item number five. At 5.1, there is a departmental response um, on support for travel agents at page 120 of your pack. We had asked for a written update on the number of travel agents who have been able to avail of financial support to date and whether the department is aware of issues in accessing support and the reasons for this. The department states that during 2020, 11 travel agents benefited from the £25,000 uh, grant for retail hospitality and leisure and tourism. 32 travel agents received a grant by the Micro Business Hardship Fund and travel agencies operating in retail premises have benefited from the rates holiday as well. The Executive Office announced the um, bespoke scheme for travel agents in March 2021 and the Travel Agents Coronavirus Financial Assistance Scheme provides a grant of £10,000 to 120 travel agent businesses operating from commercial premises or a £3,500 payment to self-employed travel agents working from home. Um, I know member, a number of members have had the issue raised with them about travel agents, so if members are content to note, and obviously we'll be able to share the responses that we've received as well. We're moving on then to 5.2, page 122 of your pack. There's a departmental response to a request from the Finance Committee for details of payments under the Limited Companies Director's Support Scheme and the Large Tourism and Hospitality Business Support Scheme. The Department states that the initial payment run for the Large Tourism and Hospitality Scheme was made on Friday the 19th of March and a further payment run um, followed on the 23rd of March, the 26th of March, the 1st of April and the 19th of April. Grant support payment runs related to the extended period of restrictions in place until the 23rd of May will be made once the funding is secured. The first payments under the Limited Company Director Scheme were issued on the 19th of March and as of the 22nd of April, 1,728 payments totalling just over £6 million have been made and it is anticipated that InvestNI will issue around 500 payments totalling £1.9 million on the 23rd of April and a further 600, pay 600 payments totalling £2.1 million by the 30th of April. Further payments will issue on a weekly basis thereafter as applications are processed. So members are content to note and we'll, this correspondence has been sent to the Finance Committee? Yeah, it, it goes straight on to them, Chair. We get copied in. Okay, thank you. Moving on then, 5.3, at page 124 of your pack, there's a response from the DERA DALO regarding correspondence from the Fermanagh Beekeepers Association on bee imports. DERA officials were aware of the concerns that have been expressed surrounding the potential to introduce exotic bee diseases from Italy through the medium of imports. EU legislation requires that only certain control measures may be applied when moving bees between countries within the EU and into the north. The North Environment Agency have considered what powers might be available to prohibit the movement of buckfast honeybees from Italy to the north. However, there are no legal grounds to prohibit their importation or release. So members are content we will forward this correspondence on to the original correspondent. 5.4 then, there is a briefing paper from the English language teaching sector. This paper highlights two pressing issues facing the sector, the ramifications of Brexit on Erasmus and the impact of COVID. We have our informal meeting scheduled tomorrow morning at 11am with the English language teaching sector to discuss these issues in detail, so it's to note for now. And then at page 132 of your pack, there is a Hansard of the departmental budget briefing from the 28th of April, so if members are content to note that also. So moving on then to item number six, which is correspondence. Um, at page 141 of your pack, there is a departmental paper outlining the results of the consultation on the mandatory retirement age of devolved judicial office holders. 
There are also other matters in the consultation um, relating to creating the ability to pay allowances where there is no current statutory provision to do so and the creation of new provisions for fee paid judges sitting during retirement. Um, just to advise members that the Department of Justice carried out a consultation on raising the mandatory retirement age for the devolved judiciary to either 72 or 75. Given responsibility for industrial tribunals and fair employment tribunal falls to DFE to ensure a consistent approach across the devolved tribunals, DFE was included in that consultation. There were five responses and on balance all were favourable of a retirement age of 75. It's likely that a legislative consent motion is the most reasonable and proportionate way forward in order to make any changes to the mandatory retirement age and related matters. Um, DOJ officials as the lead department on this matter have been working closely with the um, Ministry of Justice counterparts to keep this option open and there are positive indications that they would be amenable to include provisions for the North in a Westminster bill subject to the agreement of the Assembly. So are members content to note the outcome of the consultation and to indicate the committee's support for the approach of the Department of Justice and DFC in seeking an, an LCM to affect the legislative reforms detailed above in the interest and importance of a con ensuring consistency across devolved tribunals. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on then to 6.2, page 144, there is a copy of correspondence from the Department for Communities to the Committee for Communities regarding the review of the Caravans Act 2011. Part 2 of the Act relates to the holiday sector and is the responsibility of the Department for the Economy. Um, section 4 of the 2011 Act does place an obligation on DFC to review Parts 1 and 2 of the schedule within five years of the Act coming into operation and at least once in every period of five years thereafter. The review will take account of evidence collated since 2016 and include findings from the Department for the Economy on the holiday sector and correspondence with interested parties such as MLAs, the Caravan and Camping Forum, um, National Caravan Council, site owners and residents. Councils will also be asked to report on any referrals, court actions and any prosecutions around illegal eviction or harassment. Any resulting findings which relate to the holiday sector will be referred to DFE. So that is um, to note for now and members may have been contacted by um, by constituents in relation to this issue, so if there is any correspondence... Um, yeah, Chair, if, if members want to forward that on to us, we can collate that. Um, we haven't received anything through to the committee office, but absolutely, if members have something, if they just send that our way and we collate. Thank you, Peter. Moving on then to 6.3, there is a copy of Renewable Energy Ireland's Renewable Heat Plan. Um, if members are content, we will forward that on to the Department for information um, in relation to the energy strategy. Yeah, Chair, we're also holding that as, as part of our stock of documents for when we do work on the energy strategy. Thanks, Peter. Um, moving on then, 6.4, page 213, there is a copy of the 36th report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules. So just to note, and then at page 222, there is a copy of the 37th report, and again, to note... Um, 6.6 .6 at page 77 of table papers, there is correspondence from an individual regarding the Customs Intermediary Grant Scheme. The individual states that they have been unable to avail of the grant following its closure due to the full allocation of funding. The individual believes that the scheme unfairly advantaged larger businesses and that they had considerable difficulty in um, accessing the systems and equipment that would be in the scope of the grant. So members are content that we write to the department to ask for a response on the issues raised? Chair, it may also be a, a wider issue that the department needs to look at in terms of provision of funding itself. Okay, thanks Peter. Um, so moving on then, item number seven is any other business and we haven't had any indicated to us? No. Nothing, Chair. And then item number eight is the date, time and place of the next meeting, which is next Wednesday morning in room 30. And we have our informal meeting tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. via Teams. And we are going to move now into closed session. Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.